Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. So if anybody has any questions, ask, ask me now. Don't save them to the end of the talk. <laughs> I, 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 it just drives me crazy because people forget questions and stuff. So somebody said to have an About Me page. I have an About Me page. I'm not going to read it. You guys can read it. Um, I've done a lot of stuff, mostly software, some cybersecurity. Everybody got that? So tools. There's two big tools. There's John the Ripper and there's Hashcat. They both have really good features. They both are super awesome. I use them both a lot. In my experience, I did much better with Hashcat and GPU accelerated password cracking. With John the Ripper, I was having a little bit more trouble making that work. Um, let me switch glasses. So with, with John the Ripper, there's, there seem to be a lot more updates there, generally of a less formal nature, um, but they're constantly under development. I got very good support from the community that when I ever asked a question. Um, the custom rules is gonna be important, I'm gonna to get to that later. And so it, does, it, it doesn't really paralyze so well unless you do the magical things, the command line to make it work when you have only a few passwords left. With Hashcat, it, it's really an awesome tool. It is highly optimized to work with GPUs. It tends to work very well. Um, the, the ruled syntax is not as sophisticated as the John the Ripper ruled syntax, and I'll get to that in a minute. And, and there are reasons, there are philosophical design decisions, and neither one is good or bad, but I like terse rules. So if you go somewhere and you see like, here's a bunch of rules, you have to find out if the rules are for John the Ripper or for Hashcat because one won't work for the other one. So word lists, everybody's got them. Everybody says that they're the best. Most of them are junk. Most of them are really, really bad. The one that I really like the most is Rock U, but I've got probably 50 different rule lists. I'm sorry, word lists. Um, I needed to make tools to parse these things. Some of them had non-ASCII characters, some of them had incredibly long lines, some of them had completely random junk. And so you've got a file that's a couple gigabytes in size and you've got to somehow make sense of it, which is not very easy to do. So I had to write some tools of my own to do that. Um, but if you, want, if you want a really good one, the Rocky 2021 is a super awesome list, extremely high quality. There might be better ones out there, but that, that's the one that I, that was my go-to list. So, custom word lists. So again, since some of these are really long, and a so a password in GES is limited to eight characters. So if you've got a line that's a thousand characters long, it's not a password, and it's probably junk. Um, I wrote most of the stuff in Python short. We'll take a big file and just get truncate the first few characters. Um, there's sort, which before GNU sort could do offline sorting, you were limited in how big things you could sort. And when you, when you want to combine different word lists, you really have to sort them to merge them together and make sense of things. Sometimes they don't sort them. Sometimes they have the most common words at the beginning, which makes really good sense if you're in a rush, but not when you want to manipulate multiple word lists. Um, so I have multi-merge, which will merge any number of files. Um, simple sample just grabs a line every so often just to make, give you an idea of what's in a file. So when you've got a billion lines, you're not gonna read them all because you just can't. Um, I, I wrote other programs. I have line length and I have count. I also have a thing which does substrings. So if you have a thousand character line, you can grab like the first eight characters and then you can shift over and grab the next eight characters and you can take you know, sub, sub samples of everything. And that didn't work out too well for me, but it's a tool that I wrote and I use that well. So some of the standard tools, GNU sort, super awesome. Now that it can work with more than physical memory, it will just make temporary files and I'll just keep on chugging along. Unique will take repeated things and squish them down to you only have one of them. Com will give you things in one file that aren't in another file, which is very handy. And the one true editor, Emacs. 
So with Emacs, you can edit multi-gigabyte files. You can make sense of them. You can display things. I know some people don't like Emacs. You're all wrong. <laughs> For the, in the context of password, in the context of editing word lists and password files, I, I have yet to find a text editor that does a better job. So hashing speed. So NT Landman is the current Windows hashing algorithm. It is very quick. And, and quick is good because it doesn't use a lot of CPU resources. And so you can do lots of passwords attempts very quickly. On the other hand, from a security standpoint, fast is super terrible. So MD5 is actually slower than NT Landman. There's Landman, which is the predecessor of NT Landman. I think that was used with Windows XP and earlier, I could be wrong. DSCrypt is the one that I use. So these are, these are all relative speed. So you can see it's like a lot slower. So for modern algorithms, you've got SHA-1, uh, you've got SCrypt, uh, WAP2, and you have Bcrypt. Bcrypt is probably what's used by most Linux implementations now. It is very, very secure. It is very, very slow. And it has, I think, 128 bits of salt by default, which makes it very, very secure. So salt, in 1979, the Unix guys put 12 bits of salt in their passwords. Does everybody know what salt is? Anybody not know what salt is? All right, very good. So let's say you have your password and your password is password one, two, three. And let's say he's got the same password and his password is password one, two, three. So if you just, what's that? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So if you're just using some encryption function his password and my password encrypted would be the same. So that's bad because if you break my password, you have his one automatically. So what Salt does, they, they sprinkle this into the password. It, it's a little bit more complicated. That they, they sprinkle it in, that's why they call it Salt. And in the case of Linux in 1979, they had 12 bits of random entropy. So the chance of his password and my password having the same encrypted form is one and two to the 12th. But you know, that's 4,000. So that makes things a lot better. So you can have 4,000 people with the same password and you might get a few collisions in there, but it makes things much more secure. So again, this happened in 1979. In 1980, Unix added a lot more salt to 48 bits. Bcrypt's got 128 bits. Argon's another cool thing. So DESCrypt uses that. So the bottom line, NT Landman today from Microsoft does not use salt. So this is not a new idea. Don't ask me why they don't use salt. So the thing is, if, if my password's password123 and his password123 on, on a NT Landman thing, we're gonna have the same encrypted thing. So you say, who cares? Well, people pre-compute lots and lots of passwords. And you can either have pre-computed things, or you can have something more complicated called rainbow tables. And when you don't have salt, it's economically viable to pre-compute all this stuff. So let's say you have a dictionary of a billion passwords, and each password is eight characters long, so that's eight gigabytes. So that's not a lot. So if you wanna have the encrypted form, let's say it's eight gigabytes of data. But see now, if you have Linux's, I'm sorry, Unix's 12 bits of salt, that's 4,000 times bigger. So instead of eight gigabytes, you have a lot more. Somebody help me out, many terabytes of data. So eight, eight gigabits, you're, you're gonna byte, you're gonna put on a flash drive, it's real easy. But with the modern algorithms with 128 bits of entropy, that's a shit ton. And you, there's no way you're gonna be able to pre-compute that and store it. It's just completely non-feasible. But with Windows and T Landman, you can do that. And so people do do that. And so that makes, so if you look at the encryption speed, NT Landman is really fast and there's no salting. So maybe this made sense in 1960 but it's not 1960 anymore. Somebody should probably tell Microsoft that. I, I, don't, I don't know why they're not doing it. Again, this, this is 1979, that's what, 44 years ago, 45 years ago. So this, this is not a best practice, this is not a standard practice, this has been a standard practice for several decades. Don't, don't ask me why they don't do it. So, my DS dump, I had 1,576 passwords. So the interesting thing about DES crypt is you're limited to eight character passwords. That's a stupid thing, but in the context of 
the 70s and 80s and made a fair amount of sense. Um, so I decided I wanted to break every password. It took me five years, which is a lot longer than it would take me to do it again today. Um, so using John the Ripper and using my, and, and using no options at all, this is, this is how fast you can get passwords. So realistically, I got 1,000 passwords in 2,200, 22,000 seconds. So that's like two-thirds of them. So if you want to break into a computer and you've got two-thirds of the password, you're probably going to get some administrative privilege access by that, probably long before then. So only somebody with no life is going to break all the passwords because it's a stupid thing to do. But I decided it was time to do that. It's a hobby. It's a hobby. It's a hobby. It, it's a hobby. But, but the fact is, is that John the Ripper is, is very, very good and very, very fast. And it has very, very good default dictionaries. And this is fast. I mean, look at this. 537 passwords in 126 seconds. That's two minutes. So that, that's a third of the passwords. So it's incredibly good at finding passwords. So I was using this version and these are several different dictionaries that I use. There's the small rock U dictionary, it's 139 megabytes. There's the weak pass dictionary, the rock U 2021, which is pretty big, 98 gigabytes. And you can get quite a lot of passwords. So with, with rock U, I got almost a thousand passwords. That, that's without any rules or anything. I just let it go. Um, so there's this option called prints. I'm not going to go into what it is. It's probability, infinite, chained elements. It's a very good tool to use to break passwords. It's beyond the scope of a password 101 talk, but if you're actually breaking passwords, look into it. It's supported by both Hashcat and John the Ripper. Very, very good thing. There, there's other options, but this is probably your first go-to option when you're breaking passwords. So my hardware. I have a 64-core AMD Epic processor, which I bought used. I started this with a NVIDIA 1060. I went to a 1070, then I went to a 3060 Ti. And what I wanted was something that would break a lot of pa hashes per dollar. And all those made sense per dollar at the time. Nobody's going to go buy a 3060 today. You're going to buy a 4070 or whatever you're going to be buying. Um, but these, these are the tools that I used. And I, I also wanted to maximize the performance per price. I also wanted to maximize the performance per watt. So the, the really fancy graphics cards, the 4090, I don't know how many watts it uses, 500 watts or something. You know, I can cool that, but it's going to heat up the room and it's going to make a lot of noise. And I didn't want to do that. So I picked something that would be a little bit slower, but not, not melt things. So I went over the word list that the quality was all over the place. Um, so there's basically two ways of breaking passwords. Either you have word lists or you use brute force attacks. Word lists are thousands of times more efficient. If, if your password is in a word list or you can come up with some permutation using some magical rule, it's like add a number or dollar sign or you know change a three to an E or something like that. You use, use word lists. So here's how long it took, takes to do brute force stuff. All eight character lowercase takes about three minutes on a GPU. Um, eight character upper and lowercase, 13 hours. So that, that's a good amount of time. Now we add the lower numbers and special characters, five and a half days. Now we have all the printable stuff, 80 days. So that that's for one password. So you don't want to be doing this when you have, you know, 100 passwords that you haven't found. But when things really get bad, you've gone through all your dictionaries and all your rules and all your permutations, it's time for the brute force password attack. No questions? Are we still asleep? <laughs> all right. So rainbow tables. Rainbow tables are a time-space trade-off, and it doesn't really work with salts but it works really, really well for Landman, NT Landman, and MD5. So with, with the rainbow tables, you can usually get 99 to 99.99% chance of getting a password. 
if it's in the so so a rainbow table it's going to say like all lowercase and number things up to nine characters long and and it's going to be a big file but when you have the rainbow table and you run the software it's going to be a matter of seconds to find your password so <clears throat> this is not going to work with any modern unix which is going to have you know 120 bits of salt but this is going to work great for all your windows systems so, so the guys at DEF CON have the data duplication village. You give them a hard drive that's either six or eight terabytes, and they load you up with rainbow tables. So go, go buy yourself some hard drives, load them up with rainbow tables, and, and start your hashing, or your password hash cracking. Um, it's an extraordinarily effective thing to do. But again, with salting, you know, with, with the, the old DS script, you'd have to have 4,000 times as big a file. So instead of a terabyte hard drive, you would need you know, a 4,000 terabyte hard drive, which probably doesn't exist anywhere. Yes? Why are they called rainbow tables? I don't know. I, does anybody know? No, but I believe that there was the early papers that talked about this technique. They kind of explained, I remember just like glancing through it, and they explained why they called it a rainbow table. Yeah, there's some economic paper from uh, Philip Borschland who created sort of invented this stuff. Uh, so uh, I can't remember the paper now, but uh, there is an academic paper explaining the concept. So maybe you will find the answer in there. But but it is it is a well accepted name, and any I'm, I'm just I, I don't know why it's called that. I'm, I'm sure some smart person had a good reason for it. You're like rehashing every color of the rainbow and making an index. Sure. But, but it, it's just, it's ridiculously fast. Um, I had an old Landman machine, I think it was a Windows XP machine, and it was like 30 seconds and I found all the passwords. It was just ridiculously fast. I mean, it just, you know, years versus seconds. It, it's not even funny. Um, so here's some password statistics. This is with my data dump of the 1500 passwords. So we have the lengths. Most of them, you know, 49% were eight characters long. There were a bunch of shorter ones. Then we have the character strings. We have all lowercase, 60%. It's a good amount. And, and we have a whole bunch of mix of stuff. Um, we have different string classes. I just thought this was a useful thing. I don't see a lot of this being published with, with the, the, the password statistics. So I, I thought this was, this was cool stuff. Um, so, so obviously, if you're going to start breaking passwords, you're going to brute force. You're going to start with all lowercase because you got 60% of people doing that, and it's all a game of statistics. So now we get to the weird passwords. So when people were using this stuff, they were using they had big computers. They had like Vax 80s, 650s, and stuff, and people would tell that into. This is days before SSH. So if you typed a password, it would have to go through Telnet unmolested. So I had a tab character. So there's, there's standard character classes of uppercase and lowercase and numbers and specials and all that stuff. None of them have tabs. So you have to make a custom, work, custom character set and have a tab in it. So I had a control character here. Oh, so there's my custom character set. So control characters, I had a control R. And there's another password thing I'm going to talk about later on that had a control W. So the control characters were really quite vexing because I did a brute force attack and I didn't find the password. And I said, well, I've, I've exhausted. I've gone through everything. How could it not be there? The answer is some clever fellow put in a control R. So if you want to make a password that's super hard to break, put in a control character. Obviously, you have to make sure it's going to be accepted by whatever password tool you're using. but I have never seen any standard rule lists or any standard character list that has control characters in them. Has anybody ever seen that? You have a question? Oh, yeah, so how prevalent is something like this? It's not very prevalent. So again, I had one control R, one tab, and another very small password thing. I had a control W. But I decided I'm going to get all the passwords and, you know, you, you do an exhaustive search. See, I've done everything. You say, what's wrong? Has my, has my computer broken? And, and the answer is no, you're, you're not looking in the right place. And the right place is some clever fellow put a control R in there. So 
I'm going to I'm going to get to the, the rules about this. I think it's on the next slide. All right. So I asked the John the Ripper mailing list. I said, how can I do a substitution? I'm sorry. Question. Yes. No, just to add something. There in Unicode 15. Say that again. In Unicode 15, there are 150,000 characters that you, you can use as passwords, including anything. anything Fair enough. Contracts. So DSCrypt works basically with 7-bit ASCII. So this is very old Limited. school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in today's <laughs> world, you have to worry about people doing all kinds of things with all kinds of different yep. dictionaries, which makes the word world much more complicated and difficult to deal with. Including emoticons. Including what? Including emojis, emoticons. Emojis. Oh yeah, and, and people keep making new emojis. Yeah. So that, that's the difference between DSCrypt and, and modern stuff. I actually saw a paper of somebody that was looking into an IoT camera currently, like last week, and the camera was using DSCrypt for its encryption. And this is something you buy today. So this is not completely dead. Some embedded people are still using this. So this is, this is not only of historical interest. Anyway, so with John the Ripper, I asked how can I insert a control character in, in the first position, the second position, all the way up to the eighth position. And this is the magical rule. I can't explain what it does, but it actually works. And the second thing is how can I do a substitution of this? So, so the problem is, if you do this with John the Ripper, these are the two lines. And, and the first thing in the square brackets is the comment. If you do this with Hashcat, you need 32 times eight lines to get the same rule. Now, you can obviously generate those lines but it's gonna be a lot more verbose than with John the Ripper. But, but Hashcat can absolutely do this. So this is what I use to find those control characters. I use the insertion and the substitution along with the Rocky 2021 dictionary. And you know, in like 10 or 15 minutes, it went through the whole dictionary and all these permutations because there's 32 times eight permutations in there. And that's how I found my passwords because these people that use these weird words one of the passwords was Songbirds, the S was capitalized and the R was a control R. The other password I'll get to later was ChessWiz where the W was a control R. So they just substituted a printable ASCII character for its equivalent control character. So if I would have had to do a brute force attack of all this stuff, I'd probably still be doing this. But these, these are the rules. I asked the John the Ripper guys, they gave me an answer, it worked, I found passwords. So I was very, very happy with that. So, now we get to the 1980 BSD Unix password dump. Somewhere, I think it was on archive.org, somebody found a bunch of BSD files, including the passwords. And these were these are live passwords. So, DSCrypt was deemed to be so secure that they made the password file world readable. They didn't have shadow passwords, so anybody could read the password file. So the way I found this password file, I just read it. I didn't do anything illegal, immoral, it was world readable, I had world access, I read it. So the BSD password dump, I don't know how it got out there on the internet, but it got on the internet. And people cracked most of the passwords. So it was Bill Joy's password was ChessWiz. So the control W, that, that's the, I'm sorry, the, yeah, control W, that was his password. And I'm sure he has better passwords by now. Ken Thompson's password was this weird thing, it's a chess move with the P's and the exclamation marks. So, yeah. And, and Stephen Bourne's password was his last name. I find that a lot. I find, I find that a lot, I find that a lot. So Hashcat strips away all the information of the password file and just has the hashes. John the Ripper has some context like the person's name. And the first thing it tries is the guy's stupid enough to use their you know first name or last name or something. This, this happens, it's a real thing. I'm, I'm just telling you what I found. So here's a list. I'm sorry, well, so here's the statistics on the BSD passwords. And I think there was something like, I don't know what, like 20 passwords and something in that rough neighborhood. But it's interesting statistics. Here's the actual passwords, these are all of them. Um, they were all found except the chess whiz. I actually broke that myself using the John the Ripper rule with the, I, I tried some brute force attacks that didn't work. Other people had done that too. And then I tried the one throwing in the control characters. And because chess whiz was in some dictionary, it did a substitution of a control W, boom, popped out. 
So I found all the BSD passwords from this particular password dump. Um, so how do you defend against this? I mean, if you can't defend against it, you're screwed. So two-factor authentication is probably the best, strongest way. Um, so I have a YubiKey, I have a smart card. You know, if you have a cell phone, there's fingerprints, there's face ID, there's a bunch of, the, the cell phone guys want their phones to be secure, whether it's Android or Apple stuff. I know there's ways of getting around all that stuff, but they're, they're reasonably secure. It does act as second factor of authentication. Um, you can use cryptographically strong password, that's what I do. So I generate passwords. This, this is the output of my password generator. By default, they're 20 characters long. They have 129 bits of entropy. Obviously, I don't memorize them. I have a password manager. But if you have some tool that can break my 129 bits of cryptographically random passwords, go for it. Um, but but in, in modern terms, you need to have something that's cryptographically strong and random. It's got to be long and you're probably not gonna be able to memorize it. Maybe you guys can memorize, you know, 10 or 20 of these things or 100 of these, I, I sure can't. That's why I have a good password manager. There's a bunch of ones out there. I personally use KeePass. I don't trust anything that's stored in the cloud. If it's stored in the cloud, it's not your computer. Don't do that. So with GPUs, you can actually undervolt them and underclock them and you can save roughly a third of the power. It's a very good thing to do. There's a tool called MSI Afterburner. It works very well. Uh, it was developed by some guy in Russia, so it has been updated in a while because we got some political turmoil with Russian folks. But but it's a good tool. There, there are probably tools on Linux that do the same thing. But you know, if you're if you're saving a third of your power bill, that, that's, a, that's a significant amount. The other thing is your GPU will run cooler, which means it's gonna last longer. So it, it's a bit fussy because you have to iterate, eventually things are gonna crash and you have to crank the voltage up a little, little bit more. But with, within half an hour or less time than that, you can get it running at a stable point where it'll work and use a lot less power. And this is a reference from the John the Ripper guys on some recent stuff that they did. It's just one reference, there's a billion references out there for, for password cracking. And here's the dictionaries that I used and how big they are. There's a lot of them. Um, some of them are good. So this, this is not the size of the file that I downloaded off the internet. This is the size of the file I downloaded and then processed and I was using personally. So the, the, the file names I didn't change around except I added the dot dick at the end. Um, there, there are more password files out there. There are probably better ones. There are certainly a lot worse ones out there. And that's it. Questions? Hello? It's not working. Yeah. So I have a question. Sure. Um, I've always thought that I could take my lousy password and make an MD5 hash and then use the hash as my password. And that way I can always recover it. That's an interesting that, idea. Okay. Um, obviously, if somebody knows what you're doing, that, that's not going to work too well. So the right. thing is, there with common MD5 hashes, you can literally type, cut and paste them into Google and it'll tell you the plain text of your MD5 hash. But if somebody doesn't know what you're doing, that sounds like a cool thing to do. It, it sounds kind of brittle. I mean, I wouldn't use it for, you know, nuclear missile secrets or something. But for your personal files, it sounds great. More questions? Please. <laughs> yes. So just to be clear, uh, you yourself use this password generation uh, tool and then you store your passwords in, uh, I forget the name of the tool. Uh, keep, password keep password yeah. You use a password manager and that's, that's your strategy for. That, that is my personal strategy. Because look, look at these passwords. Maybe you can memorize one of them. Maybe you're a good guy. If you want to have a different password for every place you log in, which is the standard practice, you know, you're going to have 100 or 200 different passwords. I can't memorize 100 or 200 of these. And so that, that's why I have Thank cryptographically you. strong passwords. And I just decided I'm going to go with 20 characters. So the thing is, when you have something on, on the internet, let's say it's Facebook. So you don't know what algorithm Facebook is using. Maybe they're using something really strong. Maybe they're idiots and storing stuff in plain text. So if you use the same password in Facebook, as you're using for Gmail, 
you know, and one of them is using some bad algorithm or in plain text, and people do store stuff in plain text. You know, if your Facebook account gets compromised, I'm just using them as an example. I don't think they're storing stuff in plain text. Then you're really screwed. But if every account has a unique password, only that one account gets screwed. If they have a data breach or bad things happen, or they have an insider that's, you know, doing bad stuff. So you're, you're limiting your exposure by having a unique password for every different thing you're logging into. We had Jeremy Gosney uh, here two years ago doing a, a lightning talk uh, about password stuff. He's uh, the guy who had been helping me out organize uh, passwords kind of for, for many years. Uh, and in his lightning talk two years ago, he talks about you know well reasons for why you know password strength and your passwords doesn't really matter that much because there are a million and one problems in the world re regarding passwords and where you use them, how you use them, and so on. And he said that, well, you don't know how different services are storing your password. They might just as well be storing them in plain text. And you don't know if their administrators will get uh, uh, compromised, and through that they will be able to extract password hashes and so on. So Jeremy Gosney made actually a point out of the fact that maybe the most important thing you can do is to use absolutely unique passwords for every single service. So that if one service gets compromised, there's no way they can reuse that password to gain access to other accounts. But if your password is really short, if it's really long, it doesn't really matter because you do not know how they store your password, as an example, which is a pretty good point. And I made a small interview with him that you can also find on the YouTube channel for PasswordsCon. So it's worth uh, listening to that one as an example, because he has many good points in that one. There, uh, there have been real breaches where people store passwords in plain text. Yep. I mean, and, and someone, they use MD5 somewhere, they use something really weak. So you, you want to think that everybody's doing something super awesome, and probably two thirds of them are, but probably a third of them aren't. And you don't want to get sw swept up you know, by some bad person or bad actor, compromised system, and use the same password in different places. Hmm. That's one of them might actually be used in something important, and that would really suck. But you also said, Jeff, uh, you know, you found that there was well, one password in, in, in that dump that you cracked yourself yeah. with the control R character. The, the chess whiz. Yeah, and then you mentioned something about, you know, cracking passwords for as a hobby and you spent five years on this stuff and, and you said also something about not having a life. Uh, um, <laughs> so I, I'm really curious about, you know, how did you come up of, with the idea of testing control characters and so on? How so did it come up? How, I, I that, had done a brute force attack. Yeah. On, and you tried on everything. Uppercase, and, lower, numbers, special, hmm. and, and the tab, and I didn't find the password. And I said, okay, I've done my job. My, my, my computer works pretty well. I didn't find the password. Therefore, the password must contain something I haven't tested for. And I said, maybe it's, it's one idiot used a tab. Maybe somebody's using some control characters. Yeah. And, and, then, and, the, and these were the desk scripts. So they were probably, no, <laughs> they were, they were, most probably there were no emojis in there. So yeah, it's, <laughs> you it's, can leave that still, one out. It's still seven bit ASCII. Yeah. So I, I had another program I wrote which basically transformed 8-bit ASCII down to 7-bit ASCII. Or it would like, you know, prune out lines that had 8-bit ASCII in them. Because I didn't even care about, if, if a file had something or a line had something with the first bit set, I said, this is not something I care about. Obviously, you care about that today, but for my purposes in DES crypt, I didn't care about it. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, I, I guess this is two questions. One, why do you trust KeePass more than the others besides just cloud computing? And two, uh, Windows doesn't, you said Windows doesn't use salt. Does it, does it use something else to store the passwords uh, more encrypted? I believe, I believe it, it just uses NT Landman. That, I, I haven't been breaking Windows passwords lately, but my understanding is it's using NT Landman today. Does anybody, yeah, okay. So an expert says that's how it's done. So, so why do I trust KeePass? Well, first I don't trust anything in the cloud because if it's in the cloud, who, who knows who's doing what to it? Last pass. Last pass. <laughs> that, that's obviously a good counterexample. But, you know, something that's relatively straightforward, something that's open source, I probably could write my own if I really wanted to. So, so these password managers, they've got a master password. So you memorize your master password. It's 
you know, password not one, two, three, or whatever it is, something hopefully stronger than that. And once you have that, then it basically, you can see all of your real passwords and hopefully you can cut and paste them into whatever applications you need. And when you're done, you close the program and hopefully whatever it's stored gets randomized in memory so it's, stuff's no longer there. There are probably other programs. I use KeePass. Other good programs. There's lots of other programs. First of all, um, why should you have to bring up BSD logs again? I thought that was behind us. But anyways, um, but what made, me, what made me think about the BSD thing is, okay, so I was guessing last names back then. So obviously there's tools and I, I didn't want to bring up AI at this conference, but like I'm sure there's things scraping the internet, scraping social media, so they can actually start using our dog's names, our children's names. Sure. So but those without naming a tool, Th those, those tools out there. Okay. Right? Yeah. So it just feeds a dictionary. So, so every dog's name, every spouse's name, yeah. every birthday, every, you know, common word found in Wikipedia mm -hmm. is probably in some dictionary. Yeah. But look, look at Denny's, Denny Ritchie's password, the one with the chess move in it, the, the P slash whatever. It, it, it's some cool chess move. That's not going to be in any dictionary. I mean, it will now, but... At the time, it's, it's not in any dictionary. So, so he, he picked something cool that he could memorize hmm. that was hard to guess. And, and realistically, you're probably going to have to do a brief force attack to get that password. Hmm. And that's how people got these things. Way back in 2018, I did Passwords Con in Stockholm in Sweden. And I had one speaker from South Africa uh, speaking there. And he had done a pretty cool experiment. Uh, he looked at sort of like the top 100 most popular common passwords found on the internet, which is, you know, that easy passwords, so you shouldn't use them. But he had a fascinating idea. He looked at those, and most of them are like English names or words. And he was looking into local languages that you have in South Africa or southern parts of Africa. And he looked for translations of these English words into like Swahili or other languages that they have in South Africa. And for those words or names where he actually found a, a translation, he wrote it out in Swahili. And then he hashed that Swahili word with the MD5, no salt. And he gave those hashes out to a bunch of password crackers. And he said, here's a bunch of MD5 hashes, unsalted. You will have extreme cracking speeds with these. And these passwords are incredibly easy. They are very, very simple passwords. And nobody were able to crack any of them because who's got a Swahili word list, right? Or who knows Swahili? So he said that as, uh, you know, a, a sort of like a recommendation, whatever you do, at least do not use English names or words as your password because the majority of sort of our experience in cracking passwords is really centered on Western alphabet, English, or other languages that are using uh, Western alphabet A to C as an example. I'm Norwegian, we have 29 characters in our alphabet. We have three more letters than US English as an example. But if you can do this in Cyrillic or in Greek or Arabic for that matter, you can make very easy passwords that will be incredibly hard to crack because again, the majority of academic research and hacker research is really focusing on A to C English words. So if you want to do a good password, do it in Russian. But there are dictionaries for different languages. They, they are far less mature yep. than English. Yep. But there's Cyrillic dictionaries and Chinese dictionaries and probably. So you will only be a little bit ahead of yeah. the current status quo. Yeah. Any more questions for Jeff? No more questions. Then, thank you. Oh, okay. One more. Last one. So, so it's, it's kind of a little silly question, but I was just curious. If, if we have MFA enabled uh, on anything, can we really just go with the most stupid password, you know, ABC123, because all the strength really rests on I'll, I'll MFA? I did that with Secure ID in, in 2003 or four. They really regretted that. So the RSA algorithm got no, compromised. No backstop. I don't know how it got compromised. Maybe it was an insider, maybe it was a nation state. But these, these little six character token things, they got compromised. So I, I wouldn't say that you need to have 20 character cryptographically strong passwords. 
but, but you should have something that's appropriate for what you're protecting. If it's your cat videos, use a four character password. If, if it's your financial stuff, you probably wanna have something stronger. If it's nation state secrets, you probably wanna have something that's really, really strong. You have to, you have to use passwords that are commensurate with the level of thing you wanna protect. Yeah. I, I was oh. telling him that I, I have a, a smart UPS and to log into the UPS, you need a username and password. So it's only on my LAN. You know, you don't need anything smart for it. I used to use a four character username and a four character password, but now, now it requires something stronger. It's a waste of time, it's my UPS. If you're not on my LAN, you can't see it. So it, it, it's pointless to have that security, in my opinion. But not all UPSs are on my LAN. Some UPSs are world readable. So maybe, you know, it's a good idea to have stronger passwords for those UPSs, because you can turn computers off that way. But my use case, it's silly. Okay, thank you, Jeff.